This is Alexandra Talleyrand for the Abolition News Network, April 1st, 1872. We are talking to the outstanding men of letters, poets, and philosophers of the 19th century to get a professional look at slavery. Today, I am sitting with Harvard graduate of 1821, Ralph Waldo Emerson. He is a giant in American literature, perhaps our greatest essayist, certainly one of our finest nonfiction prose writers. Before the Civil War, he had been lecturing ever since he left the Second Unitarian Church in Boston. We are asking for a new, fresh look at the institution of slavery. Mr. Ralph Emerson. Thank you for that kind introduction, Ms. Talleyrand. Oh, it's certainly good to have you here. Would you like some tea, Mr. Emerson? Yes, please. No sugar. Okay. So let's get you started with what was the driving force that motivated you to start a lecture tour every year on slavery? All right, Ms. Talleyrand. I will answer that by saying that I gave a talk in 1844, which I felt was driven by my abhorrence of the idea that one human being could own another, like this. <gasps> that looks like some sort of harassment that's awful. Exactly. By the 1850s, there was only one subject in America, slavery. We'd eat it, we'd drink it, we'd breathe it, we'd trade it. We'd study, we'd wear it, we were all poisoned with it. All right, when did you first denounce slavery? I'd say it was August 1st, 1844 at the Concord, Massachusetts courthouse. I was ready to take an active role in the anti-slavery movement. This was on the occasion of the anniversary of the emancipation of the Negroes in the British West Indies. I spoke of senators in Congress sitting down at their desks and seeing their constituents captured and sold, perhaps to the gentlemen sitting by them in that hall. There was a rumor they were bullied into silence by Southern gentlemen. I see. Uh, do you have any fresh insights on the fugitive slave law and the philosophy behind it? I'll tell you what is behind it. Daniel Webster the turncoat senator from Massachusetts, decided for slavery when he told his countrymen in Boston that slavery was such that they should beat down their conscience and become kidnappers for the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. And they must conquer their prejudices. And the agitation on the subject of slavery must be suppressed. The Fugitive Slave Bill required men to hunt slaves and make the citizens of Massachusetts willing to become judges and captors. Furthermore, it showed us that we should not be shocked by crime anymore. And the sense of right had faded out. And the principles of culture and progress did not exist. Is that fresh enough for you? I'll say. You certainly give a good sermon. Anything else to add on the philosophy beside, or I'm sorry, anything else to add on the philosophy behind catching fugitive slaves? Yes. America had just passed a law unparalleled in wickedness, ordering the northern citizens to kidnap their fellow men and women. I felt that this is when gunpowder smelled good, when the Civil War broke out. That's fresh that someone from the North sees an argument in favor of war. Uh, let's switch to the slave trade now. Do you have any philosophical thoughts on shipping slaves around the world? I'll give you something to think about, Miss Talleyrand, that will coagulate your blood. When a slave ship captain, like that of the Zong in 1781, can throw their slaves alive into the sea so that they can collect on their insurance and no one was ever charged for murder, there is no doubt that this case was the same as if horses had been thrown overboard. I have no doubt that the despairing Negroes that jumped overboard on their own had believed that there was not vindication of right. How's that? Oh, I got the picture. Is there anything else to say in conclusion? Yes. The slave laws have taught us the meaning of liberty. It is that kidnapping and the hunting to death of men and women has brought Massachusetts down to the cannibal level and proves to Senator Webster that government exists 
only for the protection of property. Terrible. That's disgraceful. Mm -hmm. Our forefathers would be turning in their graves. Can't you say anything uplifting or positive? Yes, it's something that we can live for and by. Yes, I can. Man possesses, I feel, an unlimited capacity for spiritual growth and is surrounded by influences that call on him for the best he has for insights and greatness. Most of all, I believe, and my former church has difficulty with my philosophy, that I have first-hand evidence of God, morals, and immortality within my own mind which does really support my faith in a full belief in the God within us. The soul of man does not merely contain a spark or a drop of God. It is God. That's pretty revolutionary. I suppose that's transcendentalism. Henry Thoreau and I are central figures in that philosophy. We believe that divinity pervades all nature and humanity. And that applies to women? Yes, definitely. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Emerson. Uh, this gives our listeners something to philosophize about. This is Alexandra Talleyrand for ANN saying good morning.